words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There are feelings untamed and unmanageable in my heart, wrote Christian mystic and theologian Howard Thurman. The bitterness of a great hatred not yet absorbed. The moving light of love, unrequited or unfulfilled, casting its shafts down all the corridors of my days. The unnamed anxiety brought on by nothing in particular, some strange foreboding of a coming disaster that does not yet appear. The overwhelming hunger for God that underscores all the ambitions, dreams, and restlessness of my churning spirit Hold them, O peace of God, Thurman prayed, until thy perfect work is in them fulfilled. A strikingly honest and deeply prayerful inventory of the universal struggles of human life and faith, wouldn't you say? Haunting anger, resentment, dissatisfaction, anxiety, loneliness, and emptiness We all feel these things to one degree or another from time to time, don't we? And we must deal with these feelings, Thurman would go on to say, in a very simple and equally imperative way. We must pause, not just once, but again and again and again. We must pause and we must seek what Thurman refers to as a lifting instant. A lifting instant in which we go to God for rest. For repair and for refreshment. A lifting instant in which we allow God's Spirit to calm us, encourage us, and send us down a more peaceful path. For me, this pause, this lifting instant comes most poignantly on Sunday mornings when we gather together for worship and community and when we yield our time, our hearts, our desires, our wishes, our fears, our very lives to God's gracious care and keeping from one week to the next for the sake of my health, my sanity and the well-being of my relationships. I come on Sunday mornings with a true desire to be nourished by God's word and sacraments. I come to reset, reestablish and reconform myself to a life of grace. I need this time on Sunday mornings quite simply and quite literally to survive. We all need it, I'm sure, to meet the challenges and the demands and the opportunities of the coming days with strength and hope and a generosity of spirit. We need it, which is why going nearly half a year without it has been so incredibly difficult. We need this pause, this lifting instant to break the patterns that we establish during the week, to snap ourselves out of the judgment the worry and the fear that can become so routine and such a part of how we engage and interact with the world around us. But we're reluctant, I think, to take advantage of these opportunities to pause. We're reluctant to take advantage of these lifting instants because we don't want our perceived competition to get that extra step on us, and they might, if and when we pause. We hesitate to let our guard down and to go to God in honest prayer because we're convinced that if we do, someone will take advantage of us, and they might. So by not pausing, by not dealing honestly with our feelings of unrest and uneasiness, by not going to God in prayer and confession, we can so easily distance ourselves from others spiritually and emotionally. We can so easily set ourselves apart And we can so easily fall into a cycle of conflict and isolation and division. And there's nothing new at all about this human need to pause. There's nothing new about our need to seek these lifting instances. There's nothing new either about our stubborn resistance to this need. There's nothing new about our human hearts being inclined towards arrogance and anxiety. There's nothing new about us being stricken by what Thurman refers to as the untamed and unmanageable feelings of our hearts. Which is why for me, today's excerpt from Paul's letter to the Philippians 
and most especially what we have come to now know as the Christ hymn in this passage, is both a timeless and an incredibly timely piece of Scripture and a very helpful reminder for us followers of Jesus in these socially and politically troubled times. You see, Paul had a special affection for the community of believers at Philippi. He wrote with a clear sense of love and of fondness, but he also laid out some very clear standards for Christian conduct in the face of what was some obvious division and hostility in that community. And while we cannot be certain of what the particular issues were at that time, we can clearly glean by reading this particular piece of Paul's correspondence that he was in fact responding to what one commentator referred to as the pettiness of that time. And he was responding with a clear commission and a call to more Christ-like living in the face of that pettiness and those divisions. And in so doing, Paul reminded those early Christians, and he indeed reminds us, that what we might consider to only be a little spat or a friendly disagreement even can actually have vast theological and relational implications, and that our nitpicky arguments can cause major disruptions to our common life and to our shared purpose. Now, it's important for us to remember that in many ways, the larger cultural context for the people of Philippi was not entirely different from our own. Roman law and culture, much like American law and culture, emphasized ambition and wealth as great goods. Scholars generally agree that those early Christians struggled much like we do with the desire for social status, for personal pride, and for upward mobility. So it was, and it is, in the face of those very struggles that Paul presented a radically different vision in the Christian life, in the Christ hymn, for what true human prosperity might look like and how we might be truly exalted in God's eyes, giving us, I think, a powerful insight into the divine will and character and showing us a totally different model for how we might live. Kenosis, as it is known in Christian theology, is the radical self-emptying of Jesus that Paul describes. The total relinquishment of personal status and individual interests in order to become entirely receptive to God. Jesus renounced his power, took on the form of a servant, and became fully, perfectly, and completely obedient to God. This Paul insists, is the model for the followers of Jesus. Nothing should be done out of selfish ambition or personal pride. There is no room for conceit or for the advancement of individual agendas. Christian communities should strive only for complete equality. Everyone should be operating on equal terms and all should be subordinate to the needs of others and ultimately to the greater good. One commentator noted rightly, I think, that this kind of thinking and living, this sort of Christ-like model, places us in a state of constant receptivity. In other words, it helps us to develop an attitude of listening and of trying to understand, rather than trying to persuade or prevail upon our friends and our neighbors. And so to circle back now to where I started, I'm convinced that the only way that we can truly try to follow in this example and the only way that we can truly mitigate our very natural and innate impulses of fear, uh, the desires that we naturally have to criticize and to separate, the only way that we can kind of break this cycle is to pause again and again and again, as Thurman noted, and to seek that lifting instant, to come to God and humble an honest prayer and to really long for his cleansing help and his clear direction in our lives. One of the things that I miss the most about full corporate worship, that is when we can all be here together without masks and without fear of contamination, one of the things I miss the most is the sound in the service right before the general confession when all of the kneelers are being pulled out from underneath the pews 
and nearly 200 of us dropped to our knees at the very same moment. There, as equals in God's eyes, sinners, each and every one of us redeemed by the grace of God, we slow down for just a brief moment. We pause. We seek that lifting instant, and we try to quiet the rumblings of our hearts and our minds. We take all of our joys, hardships, strengths, struggles, hopes, and fears, and we offer them to God in honest and humble and quiet prayer. And with a united voice, and this is the thing that stands out to me the most, with a united voice, we admit together out loud that we are not perfect and that we desperately need God's peace and God's clarity and that we want to be We truly want to be more faithful followers of our Lord and that we need his help to do so. This is, this moment in and of itself, a self-emptying sort of experience, a moment of sheer grace and humility. And it seems to me that this is the perfect centering image for us all as we prepare to enter into another week when we're tempted to worry or to judge, or to fear, or to hate, or to isolate, or to divide, or to compare, when we start to feel overcome by those untamed and unmanageable feelings in our hearts, we can, in our minds, go back to that moment in our corporate worship, that moment when all the kneelers get pulled out from underneath the pews, that moment when we all drop to our knees at the very same time, that moment when we say out loud, we are sorry, Please forgive us. Then we can recognize and seek to live into that divine sense of unity and purpose that Paul calls us to when we can be honest about who we are and what we need and we can work to get back to that still more excellent way of a life in Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.